This is Mike on the mic. What's up, George? How you doing, man? I'm sneaking by. That's good, man. It's good to hear from you. Thank you very much for taking the time today. I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, we're going to talk about you coming to uh, Webster, Massachusetts, an Indian ranch, September 19th, the Good to Be Bad Tour, 45 years of rock. Uh, did you ever think it would be 45 years? Did you plan on that? <laughs> I don't think anybody even plans on living that long, let alone playing <laughs> music that long. <laughs> What have what have you been doing during the pandemic? Have you been trying to make more music, or have you been pursuing other things? Uh, just just minding my own business, Mike. I've been, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I, I keep me pretty busy. So uh, yeah, I just I just generally do what I what I always do when I'm off the road. I don't uh, I don't really have much of a social life or anything like that. I usually stick close to the close to the home with my guitar and exercising, getting as much rest as I can. And for the most part, my nose was glued to the TV, keeping um, keeping up on the uh, on the crisis with the uh, with the virus. Um, that was, you know, took took up most of my uh, my attention because uh, you know it's just a worldwide crisis going on, and uh, so really uh, that was my main interest to see see what the development was that on a on a daily basis. Uh, do you think there's any any music that you're going to write about? That is uh, has to do with the the crisis and the and the pandemic. I hope not. <laughs> I, let me tell you something, Mike. When, when this uh, when the, when the pandemic, uh, you know, you know, God willing, it, uh, it it plays itself out and it gets you know it gets a thing of the past. Who wants to hear about it again? Mm, <laughs> I mean, I agree. why would you want? You know, I, I why would you you know write a song about the Holocaust or something? Mm, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I mean. I'm just not that kind of person, you know. Some people, you know, they they do those kind of things, and that that's their thing, and that's cool. But that's just not my thing. That I I wholeheartedly agree. When I want to when I want to go out and see music, I want to forget about it for a little while. I just want to, well, you know, yeah. Bad news is always out there waiting for you. Right. You know? right. I don't like to bring it. I don't like to bring it to the bandstand. <laughs> I, I, I guess I wouldn't call it a homecoming, but you're you're near. Uh, you know, we're about forty five minutes west of Boston, and you and the Destroyers were were based in Boston uh, for a little while. What 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 brought that on? Why did you guys Why did you guys make this your base for a little while? Just for the work, uh, Mike. It was uh, uh, kind of a um, th there was from uh, from Connecticut up to Rhode Island and Massachusetts in that area was a uh, kind of a blues mecca in the early seventies and mid seventies. And we were started out <laughs> making a weak attempt to be a blues band. And, uh, you know, there was a lot of, you know, a lot of blues activity there coming in from Chicago. Hound Dog Taylor, uh, Muddy Waters played there, Howling Wolf. Um, you know, and there was local bands, Roomful of Blues, mm. uh, you know, people like that, the um, Powerhouse Blues Band and people like that. So naturally, we just gravitated to it. It's just so we could get some work. That was basically it. And then you, your recent release is live in Boston in 1982. You shout out some of those bands like Jay Giles Band and some clubs like the Inman Square Bar and uh, and some other places. You, you're I, you know you're great with the references on that, and that's a that's a great recording. Do you remember that show at the Bradford Ballroom? Well, there we did three of them, I think, and uh, I, I can't really single one out from another. I just um, yeah, I remember the enthusiasm and the. Uh, you know, the attitude of the audience, which was really impressive because I used to call that area the combat zone. Right. And and uh, if you went to the combat zone, I mean, that, that was not the place to be when the sun went down. Uh, it was not even a place to be when the sun was shining. Right. So, yeah, so I thought that was a real, uh, a, a, almost like a, an honor to see that place, you know, packed up and say, man, these people risk the combat zone to see you, Thurgood. You better make them happy. <laughs> yeah, there's not much of the comp. I don't think there's any bit. Of there's maybe one or two places that I guess you could say uh, in quotes keep the spirit of the combat zone alive. Uh, well, in, in that like, area. The, well, the Boston Police Force wasn't real uh, enthusiastic about keeping the combat zone alive. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I because <laughs> I, like, I talked to some of them. You know, <laughs> they were they were more than thrilling for the change. What's great about your live show, and you can really hear it in the live in Boston recording and any other live recording, if you've ever seen George Thurgood and Destroyers, you guys work hard. You work real hard. And I, I was reading an interview saying it's not so much about the size of the crowd, uh, but the connection you make with the people. Yeah, the connection's there. I mean, whether it's, 
reach a hundred people or a hundred thousand people. Um, you know, that's our job. As simple as that. Uh, the people come to be entertained and, uh, and the, the more you give them, the more, the, <laughs> the more you give them, the more they want. <laughs> so that's a, that's a kind of a motto of ours. You know, if they're this excited, let's keep them excited. What, what is the, I mean, I've seen some shows where you're out in the crowd, you know, you're walking up and down the aisles with the guitar. Um, what is the, what is the one thing that stands out you had to do to get a crowd going? Like I remember when I lived in Richmond, Virginia, this uh, guitar player, Linwood Taylor, he would, he would come through Richmond, uh, seemed like monthly. And when people, he didn't think people were into it. He'd walk right over to the bar and get up on the bar and play there. Ooh. So people, you know, they had to pay attention to him. What, what, what's, what's some of the things that you did to get the crowd going? Pretty much the same thing with uh, your, your, your partner you just spoke of. Uh, yeah, that's a standard routine. With the, started with Elmore James and Albert Collins did it. Mm -hmm. Muddy Waters did it. I mean, that uh, Big Water Horton. Uh, everybody I saw, that was a standard thing. But the real thing that would get people's attention was the songs you were playing. Uh, if you were playing a groovy song, that picked up their attention. And I said, you could have all the great theatrics in the world, but if you don't have a great tune behind it, um, you're only halfway there. You mentioned that kind of and on the live in Boston album. You're saying, you know, it, it and, and you've mentioned this a lot in different interviews, too. I've heard that it's women lead the way. Women, if women start dancing, then that get, gets the guys out there dancing because they want to get with the women. And women kind of recognize what's good. You mentioned, like, women loved Elvis and that, that kind of propelled Elvis you know, mm -hmm. and so, yeah, that's kind of a thing. If you if you can get to the ladies, then yeah. you can get the guys out there and it becomes a real party, right? And this, the song we we, we we connected with that got uh, got the women on the bandstand was One Bourbon, One Scotch, and One Beer. Mm. And I, I saw John Lee Hooker perform that in an era in time when nobody got up and danced to the blues. They sat there like it was a temple. And that's okay when Fred McDowell played or B.B. King or Muddy Waters. But when I went to see John Lee Hooker, Everybody was dancing, and 90% and of them were women, and the song he played was bourbon, scotch, and beer. So I said, okay, well, that, that's the ticket right there. Um, and you're right. The guys get a couple beers, and you see these ladies out there with the tight blue jeans and the <laughs> high heel shoes and strutting their thing to bourbon, scotch, and beer. They're going to stick around. you know. <laughs> so it's a very simple formula, Mike. There's a, a legendary story that I keep reading and hearing about you uh, when you were playing, I think it was at the cellar door and, uh, Jimmy Thackeray and the Nighthawks were playing across the street and you guys, well, now what happened? You guys exchanged, you, you went and played with each other's bands during your sets. Was that the deal? The deal is that the Nighthawks and, and Jimmy Thackeray thought it goes, cause they were all jealous because all their wives and girlfriends were in our club watching me <laughs> play. And that's what oh, happened. Okay. Oh, you know, right. that's that was the bottom line of the whole thing, man. You know, uh, right. Thackeray, Thackeray came into our club and uh, everybody started throwing things at him. You know, I said, this is a trick on me. I, we, we drew all the women. We were playing bourbon, scotch, and beer, you know. And uh, that, that, was, that was the deal behind that. Okay. That's, again, comes back to the ladies, you know. That's it's right. All, it's all. Ab <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> that's awesome. Also, during your, your set, or, I mean, you're going to break out the hits, right? But are, you had that really awesome solo album a few years ago. Are you going to be doing any solo acoustic performances during the during the shows? Uh, Mike, acoustic acts draw the critics. <laughs> Rock bands draw the women. Yeah. <laughs> so, does, that, does that answer your question? That totally answers my question, <laughs> Mr. Thoroughgood. Uh, yes, absolutely. <laughs> right. Well, listen, man, I appreciate you checking in with us. We're looking forward to seeing you over at Indian Ranch in Webster on, uh, on September 19th for the uh, Good to Be Bad Tour. Uh, thank you so much, man. I really appreciate you taking the time. Thank you, Mike.